So um, now we're transitioning over for some people to the most important part of, the, of David's work, and for other people we're transitioning away from the most important part. Um, but I, and for many of us, both parts are very important. So um, we're going to be talking about 9-11 and um, all the work David's done in that area. Uh, Todd Fletcher is going to talk about uh, David's work in 9-11 and 9-11 Truth. And Todd is a Whiteheadian and a longtime 20-year uh, member of the Process Studies Center and has been working with David on 9-11 since 2004. So Todd has um, been a long time assistant in this project and there's probably no better person other than David himself to talk about David's involvement than Todd Fletcher. Thank you very much. Yes, my topic is David Ray Griffin's interpretation of 9-11 and his impact on the 9-11 truth movement. Um, first, I'd like to say how mindful I am of the great honor that it is to address you during this celebration of Griffin's lifelong adventure of ideas. For this audience, above all, it's not necessary for me to establish his exceptional scholarly and intellectual credentials in order that you understand what tools and powers he has brought to the analysis of 9-11 and the building of the 9-11 truth movement. But I would like to um, emphasize one quality, which has been mentioned before in previous presentations, exemplified uh, throughout his scholarly career and in his 9-11 work, which is his courage. Uh, he has always tackled difficult, knotty problems ones which required both unique intellectual insight and courage to solve. Professor Griffin often solved them, at least to my satisfaction, and his solutions were often challenging to established academic views. He did not let the unreadiness of others uh, to think in novel ways deter him. When he decided to commit himself to unsnarling the world knot of 9-11, he made another in a long series of courageous decisions. I think we would all agree that Griffin is a philosopher who takes his philosophy seriously and one who integrates his practice with his thought. Now my task is rather daunting today because instead of discussing one element of one of his books, I have to discuss 10 books. And I've laid them out here on this table in uh, public the order of publication so that anyone who's interested afterwards can go up and have a look at any of them that may have sounded intriguing as I speak. Um, but I won't be able to discuss them in anywhere nearly sufficient detail um, in the short time we have. All I can hope to do is give you a limited impression of their quality, um, uh, the quality of how he treats the, the issues, how he treats the evidence. Um, um, and I would like, though, to, because of the nature of this occasion, I'd like to, I'm going to try to um, suggest some of the philosophical um, dimensions of his analysis, his mastery over the full range of evidence, his compelling use of logic, um, and the amazing intellectual energy and productivity brought to the work. At the end, after discussing the books, then I'll speak about his contribution to the movement, the 9-11 Truth Movement, in other ways. So um, David was not one who suspected um, that the official account of 9-11 was unlikely or untrue early on. He accepted it initially. Um, and then after not having questioned it for some time, he began to look critically at the evidence in the spring of 2003. In March 2004, one year later, his first book on 9-11 was published. Um, so this is an amazing feat from my standpoint, especially if you look at the book. Um, he managed to uh, get a very fine book published in a year from his first opening of his eyes to the, uh, the importance of the question. The book was The New Pearl Harbor, Disturbing Questions About the Bush Administration and 9-11. It came out in March 2004. Nothing comparable to it had been published previously. And it displayed the typical virgin, uh, virtues of Griffin's writings, 
the careful identification of and focus on the core problem, the marshalling and organization of the available evidence bearing on it, the careful discrimination between alternative interpretations of the evidence, and the high level of argumentation, often, as I said, with philosophical depth and a compelling use of logic. Right from the very beginning, from this first book, he focused on the core issue for all of his subsequent research and writing on 9-11, which is the question of the truthfulness of the official account of the events. This has been his principal focus. Have we been told the truth? He has, um, in, in the New Pearl Harbor, he said, quote, the purpose of this book is not to explain what really happened, but to summarize what seem to be the strongest reasons that have been given for considering the official account to be false, so as to show the need for a full investigation to find out what really happened. Right from the, outside, uh, from the outset, um, he identified his principal objective, a genuine investigation, willing to go wherever the evidence leads. Several other major emphases of his almost decade-long analysis of 9-11 were already present in the New Pearl Harbor. He initiated in that book critiques of the role of the mainstream news media and the left-leaning alternative media, both of which appeared to be satisfied with the official account and actively avoided looking in a systematic way at the mounting evidence that it was false. He discussed in a more intellectually rigorous way than, be, than had been done by anyone before him important semantic issues, such as what the word complicity might mean in propositions that the Bush-Cheney administration was complicit in the 9-11 events, and the proper and improper uses of the terms conspiracy theorist and conspiracy theory. Further, he discussed the cumulative type of argumentation appropriate to the complex issue of the truth about 9-11, which, unlike a purely deductive argument that is only as strong as each link in the chain uh, of deductions, is like a cable of many strands, which is still strong even if some strands should fail. Almost every strand the new Pearl Harbor identified has proven to be durable. Each chapter raised questions challenging the official account. How could the alleged hijackers' missions have succeeded without a stand down of the air defense system? Did American Airlines Flight 77 under the control of Al Qaeda really strike the Pentagon? Was United Airlines Flight 93 shot down over Pennsylvania? Why did President Bush linger at the school in Florida for a half hour after the second of the Twin Towers was struck? Did US officials block investigations into the activities of some of the alleged perpetrators prior to and after the attacks? Did US officials have strong reasons for allowing the attacks or even planning them and carrying them out? Not one of these critical questions has ever been satisfactorily answered by the authorities. The new Pearl Harbor was made available to the staff of the 9-11 Commission well prior to the publication of the 9-11 Commission report in July 2004. Griffin's second book on 9-11 and the first one uh, with which I assisted him was entitled the 9-11 Commission Report, Omissions and Distortions, came out in November 2004, less than five months after the publication of the 9-11 Commission Report. So the 9-11 Commission Report, 571 pages, David read that volume and wrote a book, a detailed critique in response, and it was published within five months of the publication of the 9-11 Commission Report. A very impressive achievement. Um, Believing that a quick response was important, given the widespread claim in the major media that the report was the definitive account of what really happened on 9-11, he wrote his critique in this blazing manner. Griffin saw that the report lied about virtually all the evidence raised by critics of the official account, either explicitly by distorting it or implicitly by omitting to mention it at all. 
these lies suggested that one of the 9-11 Commission's purposes was to cover up the government's role in the attacks. The report's omission of the fact that in addition to the Twin Towers, a third major steel-framed skyscraper, World Trade Center 7, collapsed, is perhaps only the most famous of the more than 115 lies of omission or distortion that Griffin identified in the 9-11 Commission report. And that was his initial uh, enumeration. He, he found many more subsequently. In the first half of his book, he systematically laid out these omissions and distortions of facts concerning a variety of issues. And I'll just um, mention some of them again so that we're all aware of the content of uh, what, what we're dealing with and the complexity of it. Um, these issues included the collapses of the buildings, the attack at the Pentagon, um, uh, claims about the alleged hijackers, the behavior of President Bush and the Secret Service during the critical hours, advance warnings of the attacks, the long and intimate connections between the Bush family, the Bin Ladens, and the Saudi royal family, the flights of Saudis out of the country when all other flights were forbidden, the suspicious behavior of FBI headquarters both before and after the attacks, the role of Pakistan's inter-services intelligence in the events, and many other motives, and, and the many motives the Bush-Cheney administration had for permitting or facilitating the attacks. The impression of a cover-up given by the 9-11 Commission report was especially strong with respect to its account of the air defense system uh, failing to intercept any of the hijacked airliners. The 9-11 Commission told a new story that contradicted all previous official claims regarding the sequence and content of communications between the FAA, the Federal um, Aviation Administration, and NORAD, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, blaming the FAA uh, personnel exclusively for the failure and exonerating the military. Griffin saw that the report's assignment of blame on the FAA for repeated and unprecedented laxity and errors in following long-established standard procedures of notification to the military upon suspicion of in-flight emergencies amounted to an unbelievable story. The second half of his book, therefore, was on precisely this aspect of the report's attempt to explain away the appearance of a stand-down, meaning that the pilots were ordered not to intercept the airliners. Griffin's book on the omissions and distortions in the 9-11 Commission's report has continued to provide the best analysis of the shortcomings of the report and the process that created it, and as such, it remains a key document in the brief for a new, genuine investigation of 9-11. In July 2006, Griffin published his third book on 9-11, Christian Faith and the Truth Behind 9-11 my personal favorite of his books in this area. This book advanced Griffin's analysis of 9-11 in important ways. The first half presented the core of his increasingly powerful prima facie case against the Bush administration in its most succinct formulation. First, to show that an unprovoked attack on non-combatants by government leaders would not be unthinkable, that is, to those leaders, he surveyed the history of modern false flag operations, including Operation Gladio in Western Europe, in which the U.S. government was responsible for the deaths of hundreds of innocent people. Then to show that even an attack on U.S. citizens would not be unthinkable, he discussed Operation Northwoods, a plan put forward by the Pentagon's Joint Chiefs of Staff in 1962 to carry out a false flag operation, providing a pretext for a U.S. attack on Cuba. And this plan included a scenario in which innocent U.S. citizens would be killed. In a line of evidence that Griffin was the first to investigate in detail, he analyzed in a chapter called Explosive Testimony, the testimony regarding explosions in the Twin Towers, 
given by firefighters and other first responders. In another chapter, he explained the many ways in which the collapses of the Twin Towers exemplified classic features of controlled demolition. If you look at the videos of the collapsing towers carefully, um, you see many features that are classic features of controlled demolition. Griffin then argued that the case against the Bush-Cheney administration had progressed from a prima facie case to a conclusive case because it had gone unrefuted. Um, in, and um, that is to say that the 9-11 Commission report had completely failed to counter any of these, any of these questions. And so the prima facie case, having gone unrefuted by this defense effort on the part of the 9-11 Commission report, had become a conclusive case. That's just the first half of the book. It's very succinct. It's about 90 pages long. It is the most succinct formulation by David of uh, the conclusive case, and I recommend it very highly. In part two of the book, Christian Faith and the Truth Behind 9-11, Griffin discussed 9-11 from a theological point of view. But I will pass over this because this is to be covered by Peter Dale Scott this afternoon. As the fifth anniversary of 9-11 approached, four publications in August 2006 attempted to shore up the official version of events by debunking the critical alternative account. The best known of these was a book entitled Debunking 9-11 Myths, published by Popular Mechanics Magazine. Griffin responded to all four of these debunking attempts in his next book, Debunking 9-11 Debunking, <laughs> an answer to popular mechanics and other defenders of the official conspiracy theory, which was published early in 2007. In my opinion, this book is his 9-11 magnum opus, best displaying his powers of argument and his mastery of all relevant evidence over the full range of issues. It is also the fattest book over here on the table. It definitively destroyed the pretensions of the debunking publications and in the process built an integrated critique of all dimensions of the official theory. Before the four central chapters which treat each of the debunking publications in turn, Griffin's introduction prepared the ground by distinguishing between rational and irrational conspiracy theories thereby pointing out that conspiracy theories are not irrational by definition, as is so often suggested by the use made of the term. He also discussed, it, discussed the double standard used by the mainstream and even most of the left-leaning media, which discredits critiques of the official account on the grounds that they are conspiracy theories, while ignoring the fact that the official story is itself a conspiracy theory the conspiracy theory of 19 Arabs organized out of a cave in Afghanistan. Okay, they conspired to do this, but that's never mentioned. Griffin analyzes tendencies of human thought that make it difficult for people to look at threatening evidence. Um, his uh, concept of wishful and fearful thinking with which we're all familiar, as well as a priori reasons why alternative theories need not be taken seriously, such as the claim that if it had been an inside job, someone would have talked by now. The introduction in concludes with a discussion of the role of scientific explanation in 9-11 conspiracy theories. And then, this is just the intro, then the rest of the book systematically demonstrates that science and reason are all on the side of the alternative, not the official, 9-11 conspiracy theory. So I'm going to give some examples now of, of of this demonstration. An especially important achievement of debunking 9-11 debunking was Griffin's compelling argument against the authenticity of the so-called NORAD tapes, which were the focus of an article in Vanity Fair put forth by the journalist Michael Bronner, to whom the U.S. military had given exclusive access to these NORAD tapes. These tapes are purportedly selections from audio tapes of conversations within the military that were recorded by NORAD as the events took place. Bronner claimed that the tapes provided the authentic story of the military response 
to the hijackings. But Griffin argues convincingly that the story told by Bronner is unbelievable. First, the tapes, which only surfaced in 2004, they had there been no, no, no mention of the existence of these tapes for th almost three years, are contradicted by volumes of independent evidence, which Griffin details. Then, on the basis of interviews with a former FAA air traffic controller, Robin Horden, and with the military liaison at the FAA's Boston Center, who was on duty that day, Colin Scoggins. Griffin argues that the tapes-based story told by Bronner about the FAA's slow response to the flight emergencies of all four flights is simply incredible. In a compelling logical argument, Griffin concludes that the NORAD tapes must be the product of fakery by cherry-picking key communications from a much larger body of recorded material by scripting new fictional communications and having them performed by the personnel involved and or by voice morphing technology. In chapter three, Griffin takes up the online publication by NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, entitled Answers to Facts, FAQS. This title refers to frequently asked questions about NIST's earlier report on the destruction of the Twin Towers, which had failed to provide an explanation that satisfied critical readers and resulted in a flood of questions to the agency. So on, in August 2006, NIST responded to these questions with its answers to frequently asked questions. NIST pretended to set all such questions to rest in this response, but Griffin demonstrates that NIST had failed to debunk the controlled demolition theory of the tower's destruction, showing that the planes could not have caused the extensive damage to the columns and fireproofing claimed by NIST. The fires were nowhere near as hot, long-lasting, and extensive as claimed. Therefore, NIST's theory of collapse cannot be true. That NIST fraudulently tweaked its computer models of the situations in the towers, changing parameters until it generated the result it wanted, Entirely unscientifically, NIST did not consider alternative hypotheses to its collapse theory, including the arguably most likely hypothesis that the buildings were brought down with explosives. Although Griffin and others had presented a massive amount of evidence that the towers were brought down by controlled demolition, NIST claimed that there was no such evidence. In the final chapter of Debunking 9-11 Debunking, Griffin took on the book by Popular Mechanics, Debunking 9-11 Myths, which gave his own book its title, which expanded on its magazine article of the previous year. Here, Griffin explained the task facing Popular Mechanics, namely that it, quote, Popular Mechanics must show that every one of the key claims made by the leading critics of the official story is false. Why? because each of these claims challenges one of the essential claims of the official story. If even one of those essential claims is disproved, then the official story as such is thrown into doubt. By contrast, Griffin next points out, critics do not need to show the falsity of every essential element in the official account. They need to show only the falsity of one such element. Griffin then proceeded to demonstrate that the popular mechanics book utterly failed to accomplish its purpose with respect to even one claim made by leading critics of the official story, let alone all of them. So it, as it's, this is my belief, this is his, um, his magnum opus. Because of its sweep and its depth, um, it's quite a, quite, a, quite a volume. His next book was entitled 9-11 Contradictions, an open letter to Congress and the press. This appeared in March 2008. His hope was, this book was written with members of the press and Congress in mind. His hope was that with that focus, for their purposes, something useful for them, that it would help them penetrate the complexities and the obscurities and maybe generate some movement in those important uh, domains of our society. It put a spotlight on contradictory statements made by members of the Bush administration, government departments and agencies, 
an official body such as the 9-11 Commission. Griffin asked why, if the government pronouncements are contradictory, have members of Congress and the mainstream media not launched investigations to determine which claims are true and which are false? And to ask op why obvious falsehoods about the events of 9-11 are being promulgated by official sources. As he explains in the preface, if Transportation Secretary Norman Mineta said P, that is a fact. If the 9-11 Commission said not P, that is a fact. And it is a fact that P and not P cannot both be true. Griffin documented 25 of the most serious contradictions, that is 25 chapters, in some cases showing that the official story has changed over time. As criminal investigators know so well, when the story keeps changing, doubt is cast on all its versions. In September of 2008, Griffin published The New Pearl Harbor Revisited, 9-11, The Cover-Up and the Exposé. This book examined all new developments that had occurred since 2004 when he had published The New Pearl Harbor. The chapters of The New Pearl Harbor Revisited build on the corresponding chapters in The New Pearl Harbor. Together, the two books serve as an encyclopedia of most of the best evidence and arguments challenging the official story. Thanks substantially to his own work, he concluded this book by saying, the 9-11 Truth Movement's expose of the cover-up of the truth about what happened on 9-11 is now complete in the sense that this expose has shown to those who have paid attention virtually every dimension of the official account of 9-11 to be false beyond a reasonable doubt. In May 2009, Griffin published Osama bin Laden, Dead or Alive. Due to the time limitations today, I'll have to pass over commentary on this book. In his next book, The Mysterious Collapse of World Trade Center 7, published in September 2009, Griffin provided a withering critique of NIST's treatment of the highly mysterious collapse of World Trade Center 7, a 47-story steel frame skyscraper about two blocks from the Twin Towers. This collapse was mysterious because given NIST's insistence that explosives were not used, there was apparently no way to explain why this building came down. It came down um, at 521 in the afternoon. NIST could not appeal to the faulty reasons that it had used to explain the collapses of the Twin Towers because WTC-7 was not struck by a plane and had no big fires. NIST issued its final report in November 2008. That is, it took seven years for NIST to publish a final report purporting to explain what happened at this building. Um, it's, you know, it had been tasked with this many years earlier and kept putting it off and putting it off because of the difficulty of the task. Um, Griffin demonstrated that NIST actually had provided only a pseudo-explanation, showing that NIST's report on WT7 is, as his book's subtitle says, unscientific and false. Griffin even demonstrated that the NIST final report committed scientific fraud. Griffin considers this to be one of his 9-11 books that most clearly demonstrates the falsity of the official story. It is also the only one in which he quotes his principal philosopher, Alfred North Whitehead, who had said that a scientific frame of mind requires an unflinching determination to take the whole evidence into account. You do not have that frame of mind, the scientific frame of mind, Whitehead added, if you adopt hypotheses that require you to disregard half your evidence. Part one of the book, NIST's unscientific rejection of the most likely theory examined the methods used by NIST to avoid considering controlled demolition as a possible explanation of the building's collapse. Controlled demolition is the most likely hypothesis because all previous instances of sudden rapid collapse of steel frame skyscrapers had been the result of intentional controlled demolition using explosives. On September 11th, this occurred three times in one location. Never had happened in world history prior. Beginning by considering key indicators of scientific fraud, 
Griffin argued that scientific fraud in the strict sense was committed by NIST because A, it fabricated evidence to support its claims, B, it even falsified evidence, and C, it ignored relevant evidence. So this is scientific fraud in the strict sense. NIST also committed scientific fraud in a broader sense by violating additional scientific principles, including making claims implying that laws of nature had been violated. In part two, NIST's unscientific arguments for its own theory, Griffin shows in detail the failure of the authors of the final report to adhere to standard scientific principles, including their failure to base their analysis on empirical facts and physical tests and their distortion and fabrication of data. For example, as part of its claim in its final report that fire brought the building down, NIST stated that at 5 p.m., just 20 minutes before the building came down, there was a raging fire on the 12th floor. However, in a report issued a few years earlier, NIST had stated that by 4.45, a photograph showed fires on floor 12 were burned out. So NIST is now burying its own former statements of fact. Another example, a central element in NIST's account in the final report was its claim that in WTC7, no studs were installed on the girders. This was crucial because NIST claimed that the collapse began with column 79, which failed because a girder attached to it broke loose, not having been connected by studs. However, the interim report on WTC7, an earlier publication of NIST, Griffin pointed out, gave the lie to this claim because it showed that NIST had reported in 2004 that the girders were fastened with shear studs. After shredding the central pillar of NIST's account, its claim that thermal expansion of steel floor beams and girders caused global collapse, Griffin delivers the coup de grace, having for years claimed that the collapse of WTC7 was far slower than freefall, NIST had agreed prior to its final report that fire could not cause the freefall collapse of a steel frame building. Such a collapse would only be possible, barring a miracle, if all resistance to the fall had been eliminated by removal of the lower portion of the building by explosives. When NIST was confronted with irrefutable evidence that the collapse of WTC7 did in fact enter into free fall. It admitted this fact, but it continued to maintain that the collapse had been caused by fire. Griffin demonstrated that the scientists at NIST in maintaining these contradictory claims had abandoned science and resorted to a miraculous explanation of the collapse of Building 7, one which violated the scientific principles of non-contradiction and the impermissibility of claims implying that laws of nature have been broken. Unfortunately for NIST, Griffin is an expert on miracles. <clears throat> in September 2010, Griffin published Cognitive Infiltration, an Obama appointee's plan to undermine the 9-11 conspiracy theory. Again, due to lack of time, I'll have to pass over discussion of this important book. It's up here and you can have a look at it um, afterwards. On the 10th anniversary of the events, this is now, I've reached the last book I'm going to talk about. On the 10th anniversary of the events, Griffin published 9-11 10 years later, when state crimes against democracy succeed, which presented his latest analysis of a range of important issues, the lack of evidence that Muslims had attacked the U.S. on 9-11, which when examined, all just vanishes. The multiple occasions on which if the official account of the destruction of World Trade Center is to be believed, the laws of physics were miraculously inoperative. Griffin documents nine miracles in the official account. The extraordinary cover-up of WTC7's classic demolition by the mainstream media and government agencies. Vice President Dick Cheney's changing account of his whereabouts and activities at key times during the morning on 9-11. The wide variety of evidence demonstrating that the official account of the events at the Pentagon, which claimed that Flight 77 was flown by Al-Qaeda hijackers into the building, cannot be true. And evidence that many nominally Christian Americans have subordinated their Christian faith 
to a nationalist faith, which makes the suggestion that U.S. leaders could have been responsible for 9-11 simply unthinkable. In my view, Griffin's most important chapter in this book is his examination of evidence about the alleged phone calls from the supposedly hijacked airliners. These alleged phone calls purportedly show that the planes were hijacked by Arab Muslims and that American Flight 77 crashed into the Pentagon. Griffin shows that calls to Dina Burnett, which registered on her caller ID as calls from her husband Tom Burnett's cell phone, he was an alleged passenger on Flight 93, the one that supposedly crashed in Pennsylvania, could not have been completed from the airliner because the cell phone technology in 2001 was not capable of completing calls from airliners at high elevation. Remarkably, the FBI later changed its account, saying that Tom Burnett had called home using a seatback phone, but without explaining how Dina's caller ID could have registered Tom's cell phone number. Griffin also shows that the most famous of all the alleged calls, those from CNN reporter Barbara Olson to her husband Ted Olson, the U.S. Solicitor General, could not have occurred and that the FBI also admitted this. Griffin then makes the logically compelling argument that if these two sets of claimed calls are demonstrably fake, all the reported calls must have been fake. In response to the question of how these calls could have been faked, Griffin points out that voice morphing was already a well-established technical capability by 2001. The subtitle of the book indicates that the 9-11 attacks in being a false flag operation carried out by elements of the U.S. government were a state crime against democracy, or SCAD, with the primarily political purpose of imposing policies by force upon the country. The failure to carry out a genuine investigation, arrest the perpetrators, and reverse the policies undemocratically imposed upon the government after 9-11 means that the operation has succeeded. Griffin argues, however, that the future is still open and that the 9-11 truth movement with its developed understanding of this reality has a crucial role to play in reversing the course toward a global police state and endless war. In the short time I have left, I would like to say a few words about Griffin's devotion to the cause of 9-11 truth. His books, so impressive in their mastery of facts and convincing in their argumentation, have persuaded many thousands of readers all over the world of the falsity of the official account in all of its dimensions. But in addition to writing what I consider are the 10 best books on 9-11, he has been a central figure in the movement in many other ways. Countless people who share his high scholarly and moral standards have been inspired by him to become active and have formed an impressive array of professional organizations dedicated to 9-11 truth and to calling for a real fully empowered investigation. For example, architect Richard Gage, who started Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, which now has almost 1,700 members, joined the movement after hearing a radio interview given by Griffin on his research, mentioned above, into the explosive testimony of first responders at the WTC. In one of Griffin's most important roles, He's been an advisor to professionals in various fields in the development of their organizations, including actors and artists for 9-11 Truth, political leaders for 9-11 Truth, religious leaders for 9-11 Truth, and scientists for 9-11 Truth. Professor Griffin has given many lectures and public addresses at universities, churches, and local venues organized by 9-11 Truth activists, and has gone on several long lecture tours in the US, Europe, and Japan. His radio and television interviews number in the hundreds and include interviews on national television in Canada, the UK, and other foreign countries. It seems to be only in the US that he's not allowed to speak on national radio and television. With the important exception of the broadcast by C-SPAN of his 2005 lecture at Madison on 9-11 and the American Empire, which did much to turn the 9-11 truth movement into a national, even a worldwide movement. He has collaborated with other researchers on publications, including the important volume, 9-11 and American Empire, Intellectuals Speak Out, which he co-edited with Peter Dale Scott in 2006. It's also on the table here. 
which brought many academics and professionals into the movement. He's also advised filmmakers on, as a consultant on questions of fact. And he's been an advocate of building an inclusive movement while at the same time seeking to develop the best evidence as illustrated by his co-founding of the 9-11 Consensus Panel. Professor Griffin is now widely recognized for his 9-11 work as one of the most influential people in the world. He received the Helios Foundation Award in 2006 for his first two 9-11 books. In November of 2008, his book, The New Pearl Harbor Revisited, was named by Publishers Weekly as the pick of the week, no small honor. He was, has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize four times. And in 2009, he was included by the British News Statesman in its list of the 50 people who matter today. As with his achievements in so many areas that have been delightfully surveyed here in the past three days, his productivity has been astounding, his standards exemplary, and his impact historic. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you, Todd. Uh, uh, yes, he could do it better than I could. <laughs> he did it. Uh, Todd is an amazing guy. Uh, being a geographer, he can write cogently uh, on almost any topic, it seems like. So, for example, uh, there have been really two really good books uh, on uh, Unstarling the World Knot. He wrote one of those reviews. You can find it on Amazon.com. Um, when I became ill and could no longer do uh, radio interviews, uh, Todd uh, took over that for me and uh, became very well uh, respected and uh, uh, called on for uh, doing uh, talking about 9/11 on the radio on various radio shows. Um, one thing. Um, Todd mentioned was uh, the term uh, conspiracy theory. And the way that term is uh, used. Um, and he mentioned that uh, I used the term a nationalist faith and said that for many Christians it seems like their nationalist faith is superior, uh, higher for them, more important uh, than their Christian faith. Well, I got those suggestions from uh, John Cobb, who was asked to write a little uh, essay. It was back when I didn't feel like writing this kind of uh, academic essay. And I suggested John might do it, and he did it. And uh, that's what he ended up with, a paper on the nationalist faith. Uh, John, if you would come, for, uh, if, you if you feel like it, come forward and uh, say a word about wh what you meant by this um, term conspiracy theory and, and how that has been used. And you, you, you made a comparison with uh, the way uh, Jews, uh, that term was used. Thank you, I'll, I'll speak first about the nationalist faith. See, I think that one way of talking about people's faith is to say, what is their most important self-identification with what community that determines then who your real heroes are, who you imitate, what is for you sacred so that if someone attacks it, you feel attacked by that. And to speak of a nationalist faith is simply to say that in many parts of the world over a long period of time, tribal loyalty or ethnic national loyalty is primary. Now, Christianity and Islam, uh, I think Judaism has played a kind of double role in this respect, so it's a, another complicated uh, discussion, but Christianity and Islam, for many people over a certain period of time, actually became the central self-identification so that, for example, in medieval Europe, 
people's primary identification was often as Christian rather than as German or French or Italian or something else. I think the literature testifies to that. Um, but beginning in the, uh, well, with, we often say the tri Treaty of Westphalia, uh, when national nations were given the control over the church, which of course was not always the Roman Catholic Church, was able to resist that far more. But nevertheless, it was uh, the beginning of a new nationalism in Europe. And whereas in the Middle Ages, people fought wars for Christianity, since in modern times, they, they're willing to give their lives for their nations. But of course, Christianity has continued and the churches exist. And sometimes the churches actually do stand against the governments or the, the nations. Sometimes they speak prophetically. I mean, I, I believe that Christians and Muslims have that capacity. But uh, overall, I have felt in my lifetime the drift has been back to the primacy of the nation, even in most congregations. That is, it's possible in the liberal wing, it's possible to criticize almost any theological doctrine within the church. And uh, the presses of the denominations have been open to that. I use David himself as an example. Westminster John Knox Press, the, the leading Calvinist press, that is the leading press of a Calvinist church in this country. And they published process theology which is not really very strongly Calvinist in terms of what we, what we most mean. Nobody raised a peep. But as soon as he published a book that criticized the government of the United States, the editors who published the book were fired. Okay, that's, an, that's what I mean by saying concern about the nation trumps concern about Jesus Christ in very many of our congregations. And I think that makes the task of theological reform is trivial in comparison with the task of, of, of getting people to look realistically at what's happening. David, you want to? No, no, oh. no, no. Okay, well on the issue of, I mean, we all know that uh, an enemy is required. And in different epochs, uh, the other, we have to identify the other. And uh, there are many ways of doing it. And of course, for a long time, Jews were the way Europeans dealt, uh, dealt with the other. And that came to its head, of course, in the Shoah. Uh, in, in our recent history, communism could be the other that was self-evidently evil if you said, oh, that person is a communist, that was, you didn't have to say anything else. Or even Marxist. And uh, when then that ceased to work, we then invented, and 9-11 was of course a very important instrument for putting the terrorist, the terrorist is the, is the other, and that gets spilled over. But in s intellectual circles also there are quickie terms for the other, the one who is outside the guild, who, who, who doesn't fit in. And I think in rather wide cultural segments in this country at the present time, if you wish simply wish, wish quickly to dismiss somebody or some <coughs> idea, you just have to use the term conspiracy theory. Then that ends the conversation, obviously, if that label applied. In all of these cases, of course, it's all very artificial because as David has pointed out, the issue is one conspiracy theory or another, but no one ever speaks of the government theory as a conspiracy theory. That's just the official theory. <laughs> it's all right to be official, it's just not all right to be, <laughs> to be conspiracy. I think that's the kind that's of it, thing yeah, you want to be talking thank about. Thank you, yeah. thank you very much. Um, for those of you who don't know, John, John's essay, the one that this, this, this case is made, 
um, it's just called a, a Nationalist Faith and anyway, that's in the title. And you can find it, there is an organization, if you don't know about it, called Religious Leaders for 9-11 Truth. If you go to that website and then you look for uh, essays uh, on that, you'll come to about a dozen essays written by Jews and Christians and Muslims. And uh, John's essay is in there and uh, a bunch of other uh, really excellent uh, essays. Uh, final point, um, uh, John joined together with uh, Sandra Labarsky and with a Muslim a scholar uh, to co-author a book called uh, Christian Jews and Muslims for 9-11 Truth. So this is an ecumenical uh, movement. It may not be a big ecumenical movement, but it is a movement and uh, growing. And this is something that has brought, uh, in spite of the enmity developed between Muslims on the one hand and Christians, Jews on the other hand, over 9-11, uh, this is a, a counter movement to say, look, <laughs> we're joined together for truth uh, about this uh, issue. Thank you.